In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by the Hockey Shop, source for sports, Langley, thehockeyshop.com. We have a whole bunch to get to, including a double feature interview this week. Features. Features. That's what we're calling it. Or you can go feature interviews. Take your pick, whichever way you want to go. Darren Millard, along with the co-founders of Ingle Magazine, Kevin Woodley, and David Hutchison. And we have a brand new partner to welcome in. Uh, everybody, stand up and give it up for Stop at Goaltending You, the app presenting our parent segment, Woody. Part of our new partnership program with Goaltending Schools, except this one. I mean, everybody knows Stop at Goaltending. Um, Brian Decord has been a guest on the program multiple times. Joey Decord is son of the Seattle Kraken. Obviously run one of the biggest schools with like eight different facilities uh, in the Boston area, in the Massachusetts area. Uh, they got coaches and directors that have played in the NHL. You got Katie Burt, who's played at the top level, of the pro leagues and the women's side. You got Andrew Raycroft. Like, this is just like they are one of the premier goaltending schools in North America. But they also have an app, Stop It Goaltending You, where you can get access to all those kinds of resources online. I mean, you name it, they've got it for you. All kinds of opportunities, daily primers, goalie IQs, making goalie series, video glossaries, playbooks, goalie systems. Um, they got daily stuff from Brian Decord on there. I mean, just a ton of materials. We've partnered with them. We look forward to sort of unveiling over the next couple of weeks all the different aspects of those partnerships as a part of this partnership program with Stop It Goaltending You, the app. Make sure you check them out on the App Store, uh, whether you're on a Google phone. I'll be honest with you, I don't know how those work, but it's on there. Or at the App Store, if you're, if you're on an iPhone, real easy download, lots of different options. We'll get Brian on to talk about them all, but really excited to have them on board. And for the next calendar year, the presenting sponsor of our parent segment. What better tie-in for a parent segment than a goalie parent who runs this school, who coached as a goalie coach in the NHL, who played pro and whose son is currently in the National Hockey League, than Brian Decord and the Stop It Goaltending You app. So welcome on board, guys. We look forward to this partnership. It's an exciting one for us, and we can't wait to see it grow. And Hutcha, you are the brains behind the parent segment, the experience behind the parent segment. Uh, give us an idea, just a, a primer about uh, what you're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about preparing your young goalie. Just a couple of tips for helping them be prepared for the next level away from the ice. We all worry about helping them stop the puck. We put them in camps. We get coaches. We do off-ice training. But there's other parts of the game that are really important when you uh, move on and move away from home. So we're going to, I've got a couple of little things for you to think about. Uh, Jake Ottinger of the Dallas Stars. Uh, we were watching that club uh, climb to the top of the Western Conference, uh, taking control of the Central Division. A slower start uh, for Jake uh, at the start of the season. But boy, uh, at a time where we're worried about overworking goaltenders and fatigue at the end of the season, He's shown us a, a different road here, a different performance, uh, Woody. Yeah, he's on an absolute heater right now. Um, six straight wins, two straight shutouts. I think he's going to run at a 955 in those six straight wins. Up until that point in the season, he got pulled, I think, at the top of my head, March 14th, March 16th, around there, after giving up four on 10 against New Jersey. His save percentage was very uncharacteristically around 896 at the time. And a lot of people are asking what's going on with Jake Ottinger. Um, I had a chance to catch up with him really briefly when it was here in Vancouver ahead of our Scott Wedgwood feature interview from last week and just grab a few minutes after a game that was a part of that streak. And really interesting. I don't, did you see Darren when he had the second straight shutter and it was on TNT? Did you catch the moment with him and Henrik Lundqvist after? No. So on the TNT broadcast, it was really cool. Make sure you go look it up. They do a great job of posting all that stuff on their social media. We'll throw a retweet on it for our folks. Um, but basically, as part of the panel, Liam McHugh, at the end of all these questions for Jake Ottinger, Liam just says, because Hank was on the panel that night, Liam just says to Jake, hey, like, how cool is it to be a 25-year-old goaltender and you know come on here and, and have Henrik Lundqvist just basically waxing poetic about all the things he loves about your game? And Jake's response was, you know, that Henrik was his guy growing up and he admired, and it was just a really cool moment. And it resonated with me for different reasons. One, it was really cool. 
But to go back to that conversation I had had with Jake when he was in Vancouver briefly, um, the problem, the, the things that led to the 896 or the reason he was having trouble digging out of you know what for him is an uncharacteristic season-long slump is he was trying too hard. Uh, and you know how that is, like doesn't work very well. You know, speaking of advice for goaltenders, man, like you, you can work harder in practice. You can dig in on detail, but once the game starts, you got to just go play the game. And if you're thinking about everything that's gone on to this point, or you're doing the math in your head about how you dig out of an 896 and boy, I better be above 900 tonight. And you're looking at the score clock and all those things. And man, like trying too hard doesn't work. It adds tension. Like think about physically what you do when you're trying too hard. You, you, you tense up. Like goaltending, tension doesn't work. It's the enemy of goaltending, as Ian Clark always likes to say. Um, so seeing that moment with Hank, it reminded me of a conversation I had with Henrik at 2014, 2015, where like well into his career, where he hit some struggles and he ran into the same problem. And the phrase he coined that he was trying to get to, and it's one I've used with other goaltenders, Jack Campbell in the American League, we talked about this about a month ago, relaxed intensity. How do you find that balance between battling without being tense, without trying too hard? Obviously, easier said than done, but I thought it was really cool that that was a big part, one shot at a time mentality. That's what Jake has been trying to get to, and that's what he's found and he's focused on during this heater he's on, this sort of end, this slump. And here he is having this cool moment with Henrik Lundqvist, who you know is in the Hall of Fame now, but went through similar struggles at various points in his career. It's not less is more. Because you're not doing less. You're just channeling it differently, right? Well, it can be less is more. Because one of the things that happens for some guys when they try too hard is they become positionally aggressive, tactically aggressive. They chase play. They get over aggressive. They want that puck so bad that they become puck focused. Like There are, there are several ways trying too hard manifests itself for goaltenders. And that is some guy, for some guys, it is mm. less is more. And Jake's got a little bit of that in his game. Like If you watch him now versus this, you know, earlier in the season... Man, he's half ice, three quarter ice at the most. He is not being positionally aggressive. And there were times early in the year where I think that crept into his game, you know, watching some of the film and then watching him here in Vancouver, man. Like, he's such a big goalie. I almost forgot how big he was. And he just, just sitting back patiently. And again, one of those things that's really easy to say, but really hard to do. He's just letting it come to him. More goalie insight uh, from guys that are playing the game in our NHL Sensorina feature interviews. Uh, Casimir Cascasuo uh, of the Laval Rocket is going to join us, and we'll have a little chat with Cam Talbot. Uh, that is brought to you by NHL Sensorina, uh, which is a, a great partner, Hutch. Uh, we cannot get enough of uh, what they're doing with uh, the uh, goggles and the different programs that they're offering within the app. For sure. But I think this week, instead of just telling you something to whet your appetite about sensory and get you excited about using it, I'm going to tell you a little story, guys. We've got a little bit more oh, coming. Story time with yeah, yeah, we got a little bit more coming uh, in one of the feature interviews about sensory as well. So we'll just leave that as a tease. Great friend of Ingol, great friend of the show, used to live in my house. Cooper Black was one of the NCAA free agent signings recently, signed with Florida, two year deal. Uh, out of Dartmouth. He was uh, notable all over social media with the signing because he is at least six foot eight. And I've got a mark on my kitchen door frame that shows that he is taller than that. And we had a little conversation by text. And I said, oh, come on, Cooper, for the first time in your life, you got a few bucks in the bank. What are you going to do with the signing bonus? And I'm thinking to myself, if you're six foot eight or six foot nine, fitting into a car probably isn't easy. And I'm expecting him to say that he wanted to buy a new car. And he said, honestly, Hutch, it's all going into savings. And I thought, oh, good for you, Cooper. That's really awesome. Very responsible. We don't know how long the, how long the career lasts. So you might as well save while you can. And then I see the little dot, dot, dot in the messages app because he's still typing. And Cooper comes back and says, I swear to God, Cooper and I have never spoken about Sensorina before together. He said, actually, I think I'm going to buy Sensorina. That's what better way to spend your signing bonus than to buy yeah. Sensor. Well, he, you guys may not have talked about it, but he would have been exposed to it because you guys, of course, Maddie living in the house at the time when he used it. Not really a lot, to be honest. Like, and, and our relationship, when, when there's somebody billeting here, I don't play goalie coach. I just, I'm just parents. So yeah, I'm sure he and Maddie talked a little bit about it, but I, I, I just stay out of it. I'm just the supportive guy because I think they don't need to come back from the rink and have more hockey talk and so on unless they want to, in which case, of course, we will. 
But he was exposed to it at Dartmouth, where he was playing in the NCAA. They had a partnership with Sense Arena. They used it. Cooper used it as part of his training all the time. And he was thinking to himself, I'm about to lose Sense Arena at uh, a really important time in my life. And I want to have that. So I just thought that was incredible. That is the one and only thing he wants to do with the signing bonus is get Sense Arena, make sure it's still part of his toolkit. What better, th- you know, testimonial, I think, everybody And the other reason I wanted to mention it is I noticed on one of the Facebook parent groups when somebody said, should I get Sense Arena for my kid? I think really it's just there for young kids, sort of age six to nine, and it's probably not right for my U18 kid. thought, wow, uh, I don't know how that message got around. I hopped in there in the comments and responded, but here's the response to that. And uh, I think in your feature interview, you'll hear a little bit more. So if uh, if spring is here and you're trying to do something a little bit different for your son or daughter in net, whether it's a little bit of training throughout the summer every day or whether it's new prep as you're going on the ice for spring hockey, do consider Sense Arena as part of your training arsenal. And if you head over to SenseArena.com today, you will learn so much more about it. You will learn everything that's available, all the great deals that are in place. And when you do order it, use the code IGM50 when you check out and save a bit more. An investment in yourself. That that's what he's doing, right? Hundred yeah, percent. Ah, re- awesome, really impressive. And and uh, what a lesson for us all. Like not to go out and just buy the the brand new car, which is something that Woody and I would do. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Hundred percent. I'd 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 overspend for sure. It would all be gone. No discipline. That's why I suck at goaltending too. Hutch, you would do that too because you're supposed to be the 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 uh, dad mentor with us. The dad. Well, I wouldn't be buying a Ferrari. It would be a responsible vehicle, but I would like to have a vehicle. I'm getting tired (laughs) of riding my bike everywhere with my goalie bag on my back, and it's really heavy, and it's not easy. So one day I'd like to have four wheels under me. I I can't remember the movie, and now I'm brain cramping, but as soon as he said Ferrari, I could think of this movie. I think Charlie Sheen was in it. It was about car thieves, Italian trash. I only steal Porsches. Oh, that's uh, that's good. Uh, Looking forward to the... NHL Sense Arena feature interviews, Casimir Cascasuo and uh, Cam Talbot uh, will join us in just a little bit. Uh, of course, In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by The Hockey Shop, uh, source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Uh, today, we're going to uh, discuss uh, a sale on Bauer equipment, including the 960 mask, as uh, things continue to happen over at The Hockey Shop, Woody. Yeah, all kinds of new stuff coming in. Obviously, you know, the customizers are launching Bauer Shadow. Warrior G7 customizers live next week. CCM Axis XF customizer goes live. And so Cam's got sort of samples of all that gear in the shop. And you know what that means, folks. We don't, we've kind of shied away now. We have so much new gear at the hockey shop coming in weekly that we've kind of shied away from highlighting the sales as part of the gear segment. But this one screamed from the rooftops. It needed to be highlighted in large part, Darren, because what you just said. When's the last time you saw a 960 at 25% off? That's a full $250 savings. So get it while they've got them left. Uh, and let's check in with Cam for the rest of the deals on Bauer Gear that are on right now at the Hockey Shop and thehockeyshop.com. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop, Source for Sports. We're in Goalie Utopia, surrounded by a bunch of Bauer Gear. Sale! As you can see, it's all on sale. The mock line. Sale. Sorry. I just getting really excited. Kind of like the Finding Nemo seagulls. Mine. Mine. Sale. Mine. Sale. <laughs> Including, let's just start here. Oh, because it's basically the Supreme mock line is all on sale. We all know Shadow is coming. Kevin's clearly never worked at a grocery store and kept the milk at the back or keeping the coolest thing for last. No, because if I see a 960 on sale for 25% sale. off, I'm all over it. Right? Yes. Like, that's a big deal. It so one of the of items is. that's on sale, Bauer, 960, 25% off. You mm. don't see that very often. So yes, Cam, you want to save the best for last? I want people to keep watching because if this is on sale, the hell else is on sale? So quick note, get your hands on it now as fast. Don't sleep on that one. Because because Kevin's taking this mine yes mine, yes he will mine. be grabbing them as quickly as possible. What else we got as part of this twenty five percent off so, sale? Where do you want to start? Well, well, you got leg pads in front of us. You got sticks here. Let's get rid of these sticks because they're in the way. They are so, in the way. Mock sticks. 
We've got quite a few, quite a few different colors. You can definitely check them all out online. Color, sizes, patterns, he's got them all. Yes, Tons. even P34 too, with the Ever Rare P34. So there's a few of those guys left. Entire wall over there, all 25% off. And the M5 Pro Stick, another great option. If you're looking for more of a price point stick, but still looking for that lightweight performance, again, M5 Pro. 25% off. off. Chest protector, we'll get this one out of the way. 25% off. Mock chest, all sizes. Starting to run a little bit leaner, so if you're looking for one, don't sleep on it. Get it done now. That's those guys there. Remember, folks, if you've got questions about the full review, you're like, oh yeah, the mock chest, I remember you guys talked about that. Just search up our YouTube channel uh, or even Instagram. You'll get the full breakdown on all the different features that make this mock line special, and now you can get it at 25% off. Yes. Pads, gloves. Mock, M5. Once again, you look for your stiff pro pad versus the Hyperlite 2, which is going to be your softer, more flexible pad. Mock, stiff, on sale. Glove, sale. Stock break, 600. Thank you. Blocker, mock, it's on. Sale. For how much? 25% off. Folks, make sure you go to thehockeyshop.com to find more about their Bauer, Supreme, Mock, M5 Pro. The entire line is on sale, 25% off. These, at these prices, won't last long especially the 960 masks. Like I said, taking one home with me today, that's too good a price and something that's not often on sale. Make sure you check them out. If you got any questions, Cam? Hold on, hold on. We can get tap in the producer for just one second. It's producer turns around behind him. He's going to notice that skates are on sale too as well. And if he so handedly passed me a Bauer Elite skate, which is, happens to be... Oh, please throw oh it. Oh my goodness, it's just floating. Please it's floating over it. this direction. Is Dave going to make his debut on camera? No, just to pass. Elite skates, GSX skates, Bauer Pro skates, all on sale. 25%. Hey, that's your mind. Ah. Yes, you can give me a call, 604-589-8299 or 1-800-567-7790. You can double check what you're looking at for fit. Is it the right size for you? Colors, what we have in stock. Also online, thehockeyshop.com. And it's all on sale. That gets in your head, mine, mine, like from Nemo, they it just gets stuck in your head. And mine, some exactly, some people like it, it bothers them. I love it. Like there's there's certain characters I, I buy into that. Um, uh, who is the the Star Wars character uh, that that everybody hated in like the the new release? Uh, Jar Jar Binks? Yes, Jar Jar Binks. Oh, I love that guy. I love <laughs> that guy. So between Jar Jar and uh, the Seagulls and mine, uh, I'm I'm here for you, Woody. Cam is my Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> yes, he, oh, he is. Oh, that's, that, that's why I like I like Cam, and uh, he, he's entertaining. How about the nine six dealers? Like seriously, the the three of us are sitting here going, I we can't believe that I can't that believe it's on sale. Yeah, 25% off is pretty significant. That's, uh, you don't see that very often. As Cam mentioned, there is a new nine, or maybe he didn't mention, maybe I mentioned it now. There's a new 960 coming. Makes sense. But if man, like, sale, we, yeah. yeah, we've, we've highlighted sort of, um, you know, this mask. You can find it in our past reviews. Uh, it's been a staple amongst elite goaltenders for years and years and years. And I just, I'm not used to seeing it on sale. It's never had to be on sale and it is now. So uh, it won't last folks. So if you're been looking for one um, for, for the young goalie in your life, or even as a beer leaguer being like, Hey, you know, like I, I'm waiting for the 960. I've always wanted a 960. No better time to get it than right now. Or if you just want a new mask and you're like, yeah, there's this, that this is an opportunity. Like it's on sale. This, this is the impetus, the, the, push to to be able to get it yep we all like new mass right it's the one piece that i look at and i, I can't believe it's price sensitive uh it's your head the most important thing to protect i just i can't imagine doing anything but jump at this mask if you're looking for a helmet right now it's my favorite the, it's the one that's fit me the best forever yeah and uh comfort some people it, it, it doesn't doesn't go perfectly but man oh man uh it's from the start to the very end and i've tried almost everything uh mine there. mine mine um uh see what's happening in in pittsburgh do we have an alex lion impersonation happening from alex nadelkovich because lion led the florida panthers in there last year down the stretch 
and Nedeljkovic, Ned's doing pretty much the same thing here, getting Pittsburgh from, they had a 1% chance at one point, 1% chance to make the playoffs. And wow. now they're knocking on the door. Well, the Turtles are be going around on around them doesn't hurt. I think last night before we record this, all three teams that were in the chase ahead of them lost. Uh, Ned's on a heater. And I'd be honest with you, like I did a story, geez, I want to say it was like a month ago, where when I first did the math on the USA hockey and Ned being a big party, you know, USA hockey and USNT DP alum, um, part of that program, part of the the national goalie camp program, a guy who's gone back to it in a mentorship role. And his numbers were like he was had like a 9 10, 9 11 at the time. He was in the top 20 in National Hockey League. He was having a hell of a season. And then they sort of they traded away Gensel and there was a dip, right? Because they they'd never waved the white towel and it looked like they were waving the white towel. And the whole team sagged in front of the goalies and both goalies' numbers took an absolute hit. Um, so they sort of came down. The next time I had to do that story for us, it, it had totally changed. Uh, he wasn't in the top 20. So I think this is great. Like, it it sh- he's had a really good season, but maybe not everybody recognized it after that dip. And now he's showing this is how he's played for most of the year. Um, and good for Ned because uh, he's I think he's a UFA this summer. Uh, he's a guy that went from being a regular in the NHL to the American League last season for most of it. So I, like we know he's an NHL goalie, and he's showing it again this year. Not just an NHL goalie, but a high level NHL goalie. So he's one of our favorites. He's been a friend of the program over the years, and so anytime. Uh, good things happen for Alex and Delkovich. We're smiling over here. Also, he checks the puck as well as anyone in the league. So we we're big fans of uh, guys who handle it as well as he does. He does, and yeah, he's got one of the best shots. And there's there's guys that handle the puck, and then there's guys that can just shoot the puck. And he he, he's he does a both. Rocket. Yeah, yeah, but he does both. Yeah. He's really with Andy Kyoto. We talked about this earlier this season. Really done a nice job of not trying to do too much with it this year and helping them transition out of their own end with really smart, effective puck plays and not always going to the big pass, the rocket launcher, that kind of stuff. Although I still, and hope maybe it'll happen on the stretch here, like what better way to punctuate getting into the playoffs in a postseason run than a goalie goal? Because that tandem with Tristan Jari getting one earlier, like if you had to pick a tandem to both of them score in the same year, and I may or may not have texted this to Ned at some point this year, I'd bet on those two. Hey, do teams underutilize the stretch pass from the goalie? Should it be put into the playbook more? I think they'd rather have the defenseman with the proper stick launching that stretch pass. And I think there's probably a lot of... But the idea of catching the other team by surprise uh, off a change or something like that. Ed Ned can do that. We've seen Shesterkin have success with it. And I think yeah. sort of for sure, Darren, a heads up goalie can catch guys on changes with quick passes, and those two would be, you know, near the the top of that class. But making it, you know, in terms of underutilizing it, making it a regular part of the game as part of a regular breakout, yeah, probably not. Yeah, I think as a tip for kids looking for that one, because everybody loves that long pass, Darren, is you also have to make a read that you've caught the other team napping on a change or something like that. I mean, just the fact that you can get it to a player up at the blue line doesn't necessarily help your team because you're just getting it to a lone player who is then swarmed by by the other defense. And yeah, you've gotten it out of your zone, but you really haven't created the same advantage that maybe the team doing a full regroup and breaking out together can have. But if you do catch them, if you do read that there's a, a bad change happening, then it is a great opportunity. And sometimes your team's trying to change too, and you send it up, and that guy's like, "Now what? Now where I go? I'm supposed to get off the ice." No support either, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah. exactly. We've got our NHL Sense Arena feature interview coming up, but uh, first I want to get some more insight. Uh, Ned was great. Uh, that uh, paraphrasing from uh, Kevin Woodley. Now we'll lean on uh, what uh, parents want to hear. Uh, what was going to help parents guide their young goaltender with our Stop at Goaltending You the app parent segment uh we are going to grow some independence woody how i would like to do that with my kids who don't play goal at all uh give me an idea of where we go well i know you said woody because you're thinking that woody needs oh, to learn some independence yes. but but well, I'm, I'm the I, one who's gonna help i was him. actually gonna say before we get to hutch we need to tell you how the stop at goaltending you app can help you gain some independence uh it can be a tool for your young goaltender to Kids don't watch enough hockey, right? So get on there. There's tips. There's all kinds of opportunities to sort of learn from the best. Uh, watch video, break down plays, 
all kinds of options available. We mentioned it off the top of the show, but want to make sure I plugged it again. The Stop It Goaltending You app, which is the presenter of our parent segment, Daily Primers, Goalie 101, Goalie IQ, the Making Goalie series. There's a goalie video glossary, goalie playbook, goalie systems, goalie extra. Make sure you go, whether you're on Android or on Apple, go to the App Store, download the Stop It Goaltending You app to keep your goaltender more engaged, give them opportunities, as Hutch is going to talk about, to sort of be a little more independent and take learning into their own hands. The Stop It Goaltending You app is a great way to do that. Hutch, guide us, educate us. Look, most of us, we're all parents, and uh, most of us know that you're usually just in survival mode as you run from one activity to the next. And... uh, just try and get through your day because you've got a busy work day. You've got the kids coming back from school. You got to go from there to each different event and so on. And so we end up doing a lot for our kids because we, we just need to get through the time rather than take the time to educate them. But imagine this guys, imagine you've got a young kid and you could just say to them, my only job is to drive you to practice. You just let me know what time you need me in the car. That creates an independence in your kid that will actually pay off huge for mom and dad as well because now you can actually step back and not worry about all those things that you have to do to get them to practice and i think these are really important skills guys because it's not just about stopping the puck when you get to the next level if you go to a hockey academy if you go to a junior team you go to an ncaa team there's a chance there's good chance that you're sort of on your own and that's really what the teams expect they want you to be responsible for yourself i was at a junior camp one time i watched a father and a son from one of the most expensive hockey programs in the entire country going into a junior a tryout and dad was helping the kid carry his gear in and get registered at the reception what kind of message does that send to a junior team Most of the other kids driving themselves to the tryout, dropped at the curb by mom and dad. They just walk in. They show that they can look after themselves. So how can we help our kids learn to look after themselves, make your life easier, and prepare them for the next level? So here's my quick little tip, something you could start doing if you're in spring hockey now or if you're heading off to camps and so on. Start working backwards. When a kid is quite young, obviously they can't do all those things, but you can with your young kids say, you need to be responsible for learning what time practice is and be able to tell me. And then maybe as they get a little bit older, we help them work a little bit backwards. Well, what time do you need to be at the rink if practice is at five? What time do we need to leave the house if you need to be at the rink at that time because practice is at five? And we can start working all the way backwards through to how much time do I need to pack my bag? How much time do I need to get my snack ready before I leave? You might even have a kid old enough to prepare their pregame meal. That would be an awesome thing for them to learn because their billets might not do it for them. And so as you, as the kids get older and older and older, they can work through this time series as they just work backwards from whatever time they need to be at the rink so that they know when to get their gear ready and when to have mom and dad sitting in the car ready to drive away. So the goal is all you have to do is say to your kid, what time do you need me to be in the car? My job is to be your biggest fan. Your job is to be the hockey player and be ready to go. They can't do it at six, but they can probably do it at 13 or 14. And you can sort of see how much of that responsibility you can share with them as they're getting older and older. But do start early. Do be deliberate about it. I know it's hard because we're all so busy just trying to survive. But if you do invest that time, your life's going to be easier and your kid will be more prepared when they head off to junior. Did you do that? We did. I can't say we did it from age six. I think we stumbled our way into it. But yes, absolutely. Um, your kids leave, leave home for hockey if they're one of the more, you know, one of the people heading off in that trajectory uh, before they can drive. So yeah, we absolutely got to that point. It's not easy. It doesn't just happen right away. There's a whole lot of work going on Uh, In the background, you have to remind them of how they have to work backwards so that they can find each of those times. But eventually it just becomes second nature. And you could work at it with school or other activities. Uh, You can, you can hundred percent sort of merge that into your uh, setup and and, uh, your organization. Yeah. And it's remarkable how many junior hockey players uh, I have known over the years that can't do most of those things. Um, and you know, you could add to it all sorts of things. Like, can you make yourself breakfast beyond just pouring a bowl of cereal? Can you make, I think that's parents fault. Like that we, we just get used to 
doing things. Of course kids. we do. And it, like I said, it's survival yeah. mode because it takes more time to teach yeah. those things. But, uh, and there will be days, mom and dad, you do have to survive. I understand it. I've been there too, but, uh, just something to work towards. We're trying to do that with Woody right now. We're, we're trying to sort of institute a little independence. With well, there's a thing that's known around here is Woody time. Mm. And I was very excited when I found, uh, on Amazon, a clock with Woody from Toy Story was with the hands and every now and then when Woody's not quite on time, I send that image of the clock to him. Ha 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 ha. Hey folks, listen, True story. <laughs> I know we said that this is uh, brought to you by the stop at goaltending you app. We've got lots more as part of that announcement coming next week. So make sure you stay tuned as we sort of completely and fully unveil that partnership. Uh, we've talked about it a few times already, but it's obviously one that I'm excited about. So I can't wait to share more details next week couple of NHL Centurina feature interviews uh, this week. Cam Talbot, uh, we're going to have a quick conversation with the LA Kings goaltender. Uh, out of the gate, though, from the Laval Rocket, a uh, guy that's been on the podcast before. I remember him talking about his dogs. That's when he was in Toronto with the uh, Marlies. Casimir Cascasuo uh, is uh, going to uh, stop by. Uh, all brought to you by NHL Centurina. Yeah, and you know what? The perfect interview to be brought to you by Centurina because we get into that. We also get into some, hey, you gearheads out there, you might have noticed pictures of Kaz wearing true, pictures of Kaz wearing power within the same season, sometimes within short periods of time. He explains that to us as well. Uh, in addition to his time overseas in Sweden, what drew him back to North America, having to wait half a season to get a contract, uh, and quickly adjusting to playing games with the Laval Rocket. We get into all of that with Kaz in this feature interview. Really excited to welcome back to the Ingle Radio podcast. Long overdue. Didn't realize how how long it had actually been until I went back and looked. It was the sixth episode, almost, well, over 240 ago. Casimir Kaskasuo, now with the Lavelle Rocket, uh, after taking a break in Europe, which we want to talk about. But first off, this season, back in the American Hockey League, uh, get a contract extension already. How does it feel to be back in North America I guess we could get into the comparisons, but just how does it feel to be back and settled in and, and have a deal and be ready, ready to go out there? It's awesome. It's awesome. I mean, the first, the first half of the season, not having a deal was, was torture and not planning on doing that ever again. But uh, yeah, it, it was worth the wait to get this, this kind of opportunity. And it was just uh, kind of a dream come true after, after the last few years. So, let, walk me through that. The decision to come back, we can get into the decision to go over to Lexend and, and play in Sweden, uh, which is, comes on the heels of your first chance to play, you know, a full game and, and, and a portion of a game in the NHL with the, with the Toronto Maple Leafs and then the National Predators. But coming back and not having a deal and having to wait through the first half of the year like that, like I, I sort of struggle to imagine what that would be like and how much stress that would be. You've got a young family as well. Um, walk me first through the decision and, and sort of how tough that was and how you stayed on top of your game and focused throughout it. Yeah. I mean, obviously going over to Europe is, is a different conversation, but just cu coming back after the two years, it was something that I felt like I, where I wanted to play, it was going to be like mentally for, for me as well. It's playing the AHL and then hopefully work my way towards the NHL is something that, you know, keeps me motivated. And, um, yeah, it's, I just enjoy playing here a lot. It's easier for the family kind of closer to home. Uh, that's Minnesota now. And, uh, yeah, I just, I just really enjoy the, the hockey here and, um, how the, the version I get out of myself as a goalie and a person out here is, is something that, uh, I feel like it's better. So, that was something that uh, kind of after being in Europe the last two years and turning 30 uh, in the fall, it was kind of felt like the last chance to come over. I think uh, not a lot of guys get to do that at, at my age. So at, at least my, uh, my previous experience in North America probably helped with that. So uh, yeah, it was kind of like the last chance to, to come back and, um, yeah, that that's always always been the goal to you know play North America. It's what I enjoy. So, 
um, yeah, I just had to had to wait it out. I mean, it wasn't wasn't easy because it took until almost Christmas to to get that opportunity. And uh, you know, just skating skating with one guy during the fall, and you know, trying to trying to find ice time, just trying to stay sharp. And when nothing was really biting, it was it, it was tough. But uh, you know, being being in this position right now, all is all is forgotten, and uh, it was worth the wait. What was the focus when you're just skating one guy? Like, how do you advice for other goalies? Maybe, I mean, we're heading into the summer for a lot of goalies. They won't have an opportunity. Not everybody plays spring league right down to young ages. Um, what'd you focus on to try and stay as sharp as you could as much as you don't get game action other than, you know, the beauty league in the summer. How do you, how do you sort of throughout the fall, try and stay at your best without you know, live as much live action or as much as what we would normally associate with it, with a team structured style practice and obviously no games. Yeah. I mean, just, just the foundation and work on the simple things when you're on the ice for two, three times a week. And you just want to make sure that, you know, you're square to the box and you're pushing and stopping the right way and your slides are good. Cause you know, at that point, um, you, you never knew like if it was that day you get a call and you have to leave and go play in a couple of days. So I think it was more of just being, being fundamentally strong and focusing on those little things. Obviously just what one, two or three guys out there shooting, you can't, can't really do much. So it's just about uh, having, having good habits with, with the simple things like tracking and being on positioning and post play and, uh, so it was also a good time to, you know, I get to, I get to pick some drills when I wanted to work on. So, uh, obviously when I, when I did sign and had to go and, uh, I knew the, the first game was, was coming up. So it was, uh, a little nerve wracking, you know, not having really team practices for the first, uh, for, for nine months or so. And, uh, I still remember the first practice the guys were coming little bit more pace and the shots were coming a little faster. It was a lot more guys on the ice. So it was, but it took like one drill and I was right into it. So, um, yeah, it felt felt good from, from the start. I was going to say too, like nine months and the success you had right out of the gate in Laval as well. Like, did you surprise yourself even a little bit? Just, I think you, like you probably, like if it was me, I would have been giving myself some grace. Like, Hey, this might take a little bit. And yet you jumped in with both feet and were quickly off and running. Yeah, I think the big thing is like even what our uh, what our goalie coach here reminds me of almost almost weekly is that hey, hey have fun and battle it out because you know a couple months ago you were back at home sitting on the couch so uh, yeah I think it was just tapping into that experience especially in the in a familiar division in the in the north division and you know like straight I signed flew. Blue into Syracuse to meet the team on the road, and I was like, <laughs> "I've been here too many times already." So um, it kind of all felt comfortable, and I was able to, you know, find that routine. And after that, it was just, you know, one game at a time. Let's let's survive one one here first, and do my best and mentally sharp. And uh, I know I can play. I've played in this league before. I know I'm I can play well. So yeah, it was just about making those first couple saves, and then. It felt like myself from five years ago. So, I mean, you mentioned your goalie coach, and obviously Marco Marciano is a guy we know really well here at InGoal. Uh, again, sliding right in, having to build a relationship on the fly. What's that like? What advice could you give to other goalies that face a similar situation? Maybe not at the at the American League at the peak of the sport, but you know, kids that go in and meet new goalie coaches and got to get working on the ice with them right away. It's the best approach to sort of building a relationship with a new guy. Yeah, I think uh, we had a couple of younger guys, and obviously Dobesh is a first year guy. So uh, Marco is a little tougher on him, and he was just he was just happy to have me, and kind of gave me a great period to get get uh, used to the things, and uh, knows I'm I'm a little more experienced, so he kind of gives a little leeway off for me. So, uh, but yeah, it was it was good. I mean. I think it was a good good balance. I like I like Dobie a lot. We have a good relationship, and Marco is is like balances both of us great. And you know he's he's passionate. He knows certain things that he he wants us to do, and whether it's tennis balls off the ice, and 
Uh, so he, he really cares and uh, tries to build a whole package. But yeah, it's it's been good. Like trying to think for, for kids to hop on a new team. I think it's more like uh, you just do the things you can, the best you can. I obviously show up as yourself and, uh, you know, to do your best. And it's, it's a team game after all. So you have to uh, blend it in. And the, the, the quicker I got comfortable with the guys and, with Marco, it was, you know, the quicker I felt more confident on the ice and with the group that we had. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a team game. Within, it's an individual sport within a team game, I guess. So it's uh, it's very important to have those relationships. And, yeah, especially with the, the goalie group and, and Marco, it's uh, kind of our, our own team and we support each other. So, um, yeah, we fit right in right away. You mentioned North American style of game and enjoying it more. I actually don't want to put words in your mouth, but and it may be suiting you more. Do you mean game like suit your game more, suit what you prefer style wise to play more? Can you give me a couple of examples of why you prefer the style over here and how it might fit you a little better than maybe what you experienced overseas? Yeah, I think the smaller rink, I like it better. Uh, how how the the game is, you know, when the the puck's in your zone, you have to be fully alert at all times and it feels like there's much more going on and um yeah trying to have to be ready in those those situations it's quick plays here and there and like quick movement of the puck and, and shot to the net and guys crashing in and uh whether as in europe it was more you know there's guys entering the stone and they go to the corners they have a lot more space in the corners and they just pass the puck around there's a lot more open space and then they kind of you know make their way into a scoring chance and then they get to rip it from close close uh pretty close so i think i think here it's uh north america like the play develops somewhat simpler and you know when the guys are entering the zone you can kind of see the couple options and then it's it's bang bang and they do the do the plays other than Europe, it might take longer time in the zone. And, you know, it kind of, even though they have more space to escape faster, sometimes it feels slower because there's more space and they get to, you know, slow the game down and find guys who are open on the bigger sheet. And um, so I just kind of like that part where, you know, I have to be alert and the puck's moving a lot here in North America. And then, then Europe kind of, you know, the puck comes into the zone, you can almost just stand straight when they're in the corner because, you know, it's going to take 10 seconds for them to wheel it around back to the other corner. But, um, yeah, so that was that was something like like going back to the first game. First game back, it was, you know, um, it was so much easier to be involved in the whole, whole game when, you know, you feel like guys are on top of you and plays happen fast and bucks are coming to the net. You're engaged the whole time. You don't have a choice over here. Yeah, not that I wasn't trying to be not engaged in, in Europe, right, but, right. Uh, yeah, it just it just feels like there's a threat at all times. I feel like here, like you, you never know when the puck's coming to the net, and I feel like that helps me being sharper and ready when when the puck is in the zone. Is did you find any benefit? And we've heard this, you know, from different guys over past years, and maybe it's shifted because it's been a few years since I've asked, you know, a lot of guys about it, but that need for patience over there because of all the passing, because it's less direct and funnel pucks. It's more East West and pass, pass, dust it off and pass again. Right. Like skating edge work, holding edges. Can you find a way to improve elements that translate here as the game here also becomes again, maybe not as much passing, but certainly a lot more East West and faster in North America now than, than it was five years ago. Even. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, in, in Europe, you have to really get to your spots and have, have good skating. Like I said, like guys come in the zone and they kind of slow it down there. Usually they, they're trying to find a, find a pass. And if, if not, they have more, more space to adjust and change the angle and shoot. So I think, um, obviously skating and crease movement is important for, for in any league, but, yeah, in, in North America, sometimes, you know, when there's a pass, they have to shoot from wherever they get it. So you can kind of explode and take the space away. Other than Europe, you might have to, uh, they have more space to just 
grab the puck and pass it again. So I think it's uh, not that it's it's more reads, but I think it's it's just different when you're moving and placing yourself in some of those some of those places. I feel like maybe moving your feet a little bit more other than than sliding in North America a little bit more. But yeah, I think it I think it just comes down to like what kind of reads you can make and how how it make like for me it suits better to be in North America and make those those reads that I get from here. I feel like in Europe sometimes when I was I was missing out on one more read maybe that um uh, didn't know that they would have that option. But you know, over time in there too, like I I was able to make those reads as well. So it's uh now coming back it's like all those old reads are kicking in again and I feel like it's easier to make the game kind of simple that way for me. What um what about from a coaching standpoint? Like is there anything about your game that changed from your time over there? I mean we're always evolving. Um different coaching philosophies, different style of game obviously in Sweden, but is there anything you learned at Lexen that you brought back here or changes, you know, in your evolution from your two years over there working with, you know, like you said, different coaches in a different style? I think it's mostly experiences. Um, you know, getting getting games over there and going through the ups and the downs and you know for goalie it's it's important to get that and get mentally stronger and go through the bad times so you can maybe navigate them easier the next time and uh, obviously play playing games is the most important thing so getting getting that experience for sure um yeah but i like it, it was a continued theme from uh for me from I know when what I can do to be successful and what I need to do and how I need to play. So we kind of continued that in in Sweden and you know trying to make that work for that kind of game. And then coming back, I can still be me and what works. And it was just last week here, Marco was showing me video when I played for the Wolves, my second year pro. Hey, like you can you can do these things and this is how you play, and I can still recognize. I played the same exact way now. So uh, it's just about putting those experiences together and making the, making the right reads at this point and just letting myself play how I need to play. Connect the dots, connect the patterns, right? As we hear so often, I'm curious, like, so, so for those, you know, for those listening, that don't maybe have a picture of how you play, maybe share you know how you see your game and what elements you saw in that old footage that are still there today that are part of that foundation you've maintained yeah i think the biggest thing for me is to get to my spots uh and usually if it if it looked like i had an easy game i played my best you know a little deeper trying to play with smart depth that's always been one of my strengths and making the reads and get to my spots when there's a there's a pass and you know and when needed trying to be explosive as well and make those reads so i think the biggest thing for me like i said is is the reads and moving moving to the spots and uh when i'm in the right spot the saves usually should look fairly easy so yeah just calm and controlled and play playing the crease and not not come out too far and that way i always you know give myself a chance to be being the play and yeah when don't usually have to be too explosive but sometimes gotta allow myself to uh and have to do it because the game is fast <laughs> i was just gonna say you know it's there right so that's sort of always been there for you i guess in some ways sounds like learning to use it as a last resort or you know to make sure you're fundamentally there early set square all those elements we hear so often and then when you need to you got to go to the athleticism but not to have to rely on it too early too often yeah, yeah, I definitely noticed myself on some place where okay, like, or even practice. I noticed it most when uh, maybe in this situation I could have maybe like reached out more and like fell on my belly to try to make a save, other than just trying to be a controlled slide over. So yeah, it's it's the control first, and then I kind of tried to allow myself to make some unorthodox saves sometimes and allow my like my explosiveness to come out that way other than just always being uh super super controlled and and calm you talked about reads a lot and obviously reads are 
you know, fundamental for every goalie. Every goalie really re- relies on them to varying degrees, but we all rely on them in some way, shape, or form. How, other than experience, do you get better at it? Like, do you just have to play the games to be able to see those patterns forming and know what to look for? Or have you over the years studied video, studied yourself, studied opponents to find, you know, patterns or different dots that you can connect and make it easier when you're on the ice? I think the experience is a big thing. Um, I don't know where I gained it or the good reads. Maybe um, I think the spark depth is a, a big thing for me as well. I'm not coming out too far on the first first guy who's in the in the rush. And then it's, you know, taking a little, a look at what you see and how, for me, it's, it's, it's a read and it's almost like a, how I feel in that situation too. And more often than not, it ends up being right. And then, you know, just getting, getting to the spot. So I think definitely like watching video too, um, you might not always see in those situations, what guys are, what guys are open or what they're thinking and how my positioning was in that in certain place and free scout too helps a lot, especially looking at uh, the other team's power plays and what they're looking for and where their guys are at. So it kind of helps me set up and look for those certain patterns and certain options that they might have. Uh, and then just kind of place myself in a position where I can, I can get there, which, you know, reads and, and positioning and depth kind of go all go hand in hand to uh to make a successful play. So you said smart depth, and I realized that you know you said depth and reads go hand in hand. So it's not the same depth every time. Depends what you're seeing. Depends where guys are and what the attack looks like. But what in your mind is there like sort of a, a range that you would consider smart depth generally, or a starting point for you? Uh, is it you know half ice in the crease, three quarters, toes in the edge of crease, heels on? And I know it will vary depending on place, but is there sort of a, I guess, a starting point, a home base? Yeah, I think if, if it's like a three on two coming down um, from the boards, I think I'm, I'm definitely like mid crease, and uh, I don't I don't need to be any further out. I can probably even be further down because you usually know like if he's going to have a dangerous shot, he has to come a lot closer to be able to shoot it, and you can adjust while he's doing that, and then mostly or usually he's going to have to make a pass and then when there's a pass then you just shuffle or t push to this next spot and then you get some more depth that way so um i think it was a good we did uh we were in toronto steve Briere ran a thrill drill for us when we had to stay in the on the goal line and the guys would come down to the boards and shoot and we were all making all the saves. So it's like we can be down in the on the stand on the goal line, but we can still make all those saves from further out. So we don't have to lose the play if we come out out of the blue out of the blue, they make a pass, then you have all the space to cover to move across. So I think that's something that I could, you know, and even if they make a pass, then you're you're deep. You can just push up to the top of the crease wherever you need to go. So I think that's the that's the thing that um, I'm pretty good at not doing is getting caught too too far out on certain plays. So uh, yeah, that's just you know I see a lot of it, especially getting into co- coaching younger kids this this past summer and other goalies even in the league when the the play develops from the boards and the rush comes down, the guys are super far out, like. Yeah, if they shoot it from there, you're going to make an easy save. But now there's a pass, and now you might be a little bit behind if they pass again or adjust. So I think for me, it's like just standing back, seeing what the options are, having them make the first play and the first move, and then just reacting to that and then go from that first deep spot, have all the options open for me still. So then get, get to the point B and be ready for that. I, I love the example of being back. I love like the sound of the drill from Briere. Was there any point where you were, because a lot of guys will start, you know, and this, this is varied over periods of sort of the history of goaltending. But, you know, even now there are guys, as you said, that will start by taking ice and retreating and trying to sort of match their, the timing of their retreat to the flow 
of an odd man rush. Was that ever your game at all? Or is that inside out rather than outside in philosophy always sort of been something you've had? I think definitely maybe growing up, I could see myself coming out and then doing that, like coming out and then them backing up and, you know, but the game is so fast right now. And for me, I just like to be deeper and I can, you know, have all the options in front of me and all the, all the players I can kind of control where, where things are. And uh, when they make a pass, I know I can, I can get to point B and if they just throw it at the net, I can still control that shot since even if I'm deep or not, but um, yeah, I think, I think the smart depth is just, you know, something that, uh, you know, like you, like you said, we still, we'll still see a lot of guys challenging on the, on the first, first one, but it's, it's a different rushes need that too. If, if, if it's a two on one, some guys like might want to play that if they talk to their D2, how they want to play them. But for me, I just like to, uh, a little deeper and I know I can adjust and get to get to the top of the crease if I if I need to. I guess you probably feel like it would help you feel more patient too. Like you can wait a little longer and see it unfold because you know it's a shorter move. Whereas sometimes when we're really far out and that pass goes across, I you, you just sort of innately feel rushed a little bit because you are playing a little bit of catch up because say you've got another three or four feet to cover off to get across. Yeah, I'm definitely feel controlled and confident in where I'm at and comfortable so it's just you know like i know if he shoots i'm gonna be able to make the save but if he passes i can get there on my feet i'm not like selling myself on the first on the first pass so um yeah i think i think that's just the biggest thing that you know if and different goalies might feel comfortable playing you know heels on the top of the crease if they if they want to and then just trust their movement for for me it's more like okay i need to see how this this develops and like a little deeper is where I'm comfortable. And, you know, when I feel comfortable, it's usually much, much easier to play and confident and control in all those situations. Um, now, Hey, one thing I noticed, I think everybody noticed because we're goalie gear geeks and you used to be a guy who was all into gear. I think a lot of people have noticed the switch to true on the pads. Um, that process, you tried some different stuff as you're going through the fall and in the summer. Um, walk me through sort of how you ended up there because it, it feels like a completely different style from the Bowery you were using before and yet within each company there are things they can do in the builds to make them more even though nobody builds it like Bower you know obviously True can make a stiff pad too so I'm just kind of curious or as you end up in Montreal and as you end up trying new things what led you down that path and how much experimentation was there yeah I think I've loved the, the Bower pad that I've had now for five ish years that was i think a 2x 2s 2s pad somehow with the with the very flexible traditional knee block that moves a lot which i uh, i like being able to move when i'm on my knees and reverse and lean over the pad but yeah i had i had no thoughts of of switching out of that pad and always wanted to try true i even tried to reach out to true this past summer to test some stuff out but it just didn't work out and um yeah, always very comfortable and very enjoyed my my Bauer sets and obviously the factory being here and and Pat coming and wanting to make me a set um, and while also ordering a new set of Bowers. So uh, the new Bowers came in. Uh, I think I played two games in them. Okay, so I got I, pulled. I, I, I'm not wrong. You you have used you have gone back and forth, right? I wasn't sure if I saw that correctly. Yeah, so I think I was five and zero, so I had to I had to use the my old Bowers from from Sweden, so I couldn't switch out of those because those were basically street hockey pads after after one year of usage. So they were very mobile, let's just say mobile. <laughs> and um, so I got the new Bowers. I'm trying to like break them in because they obviously feel a lot like rigid than than my one year old pads and. When I felt like they were good enough to play, um, I used them in two games, and I got pulled in both. So, and I had this this brand new set of trues just in my stall waiting for me. So, um, obviously, here and there, like skated with them, and they still had the 
the same mobility and uh, the rotation was great. And even though it's a slightly maybe boxier bat than than my Bowers were and more rigid, harder corners, um, but it still had the same flexible knee block. So I'm able to have that that flexibility and mobility on the around when I'm on my knees. And um, like I've tried the the mock knee block that's built into the core and that's just terrible for me i you know i go down and i feel like it like pushes me back on my my balance because the bat doesn't give out at all um so for me the the flexible knee block is important and then yeah just just skate it with them a couple times i i like how the truths like we're sitting on my leg i think it's more of a raised boot as well other than what my bowers had and more of uh there's like a little indent for the skate. A channel, yeah. Um, yeah, so skated with them a couple times, uh, but then I was still trying to break in the new Bowers and, you know, trying to get them in the game shape. And then, you know, I got pulled twice and then then I got a little injury. And while I was coming back and skating a little bit, I, uh, you know, I was I went full all in on the on the trues. And yeah, it's 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 just been a great pad. I think the balance I have when I go down and while still having that flexibility, like I said, and just how everything rotates and knows and how it sits on my leg. And, uh, I almost feel like when I go down, it like comes out further than the bowers. So it like takes a little bit more space away. Um, I would imagine like even just the knee block, like I didn't realize you were in still a traditional knee block in the bower. Like he, you know, beforehand in that old set, it would feel a lot more almost natural to you, the true one compared to, you know, again, more of a traditional style knee block than the shift we've seen to, you know, that one piece connected. Yeah. Yeah. The Bauer one is really, really flexible and the true, true has enough, enough flexibility for me to, you know, move around confidently around the post and stuff. And um yeah and i just like i said i feel like they come out a little bit more so when i go down it flares out a little better and like maybe it's an inch or so like further out so i've noticed a lot of pucks they're hitting like just the corner of the pad and it's a save and even my boot kind of like i get a good rotation i'm come like i have a lot of toe slack so it's good for my joints but uh, the pad is still the, the boot is still flared out and takes away that space a little bit more than the, the Bauer did. So, yeah. And they, they got a win on their, on the first game. So I'm, I'm sticking with them now. <laughs> of course. Hey, I, it's, I can't remember who said it first, right? I'm not superstitious. I'm a little, just a little stitious. Yeah. That, it's, it's mental. The goaltending is all mental. And if it's like, if you have, even if you have the same, same gear, but one set is white, another set is dark, then that could be all you need to, to switch things up. So, um, so if you've if Pat's come out to you, does, have you had a chance to see the factory and, and sort of see some of the history with Michelle when he's in there and the family business? Because we got we got to do that back when they were connected with CCM. And I, I feel like it's a, you know, I feel like you'd be into the history side of things, too. You're in, you know, you're in Laval, you're in Montreal area. If you haven't already, I would highly recommend if they'll have you out to check that out because it is a pretty neat experience. Yeah, I did get to go. Um Bonesy was actually visiting at the time and Bonesy has been trying to sell like sell his true gear to me and having me try it on and all this kind of stuff for, for a few years now. So I know he's a, he's big and true. So, uh, it was a perfect timing. Like Pat wanted us to come, come over for a visit and, uh, yeah, it's a great, great setup that they had and finally able to kind of, you know, their, what they offer is so simplistic too. It, you know, this is how the, the boot options this is the strapping option this is the flex option basically and the gloves they have the three models and so uh yeah it was just kind of cool to walk around the factory too how they they make it and that was shown on the, the cores of the pads and what the differences are and there's there's people lacing up the gloves and all that kind of stuff so um and all the all the bins that are some nhl goalies pads are getting built there so uh yeah that was definitely a cool experience and you know just some of the old old pieces of gear that they have laying around and it's crazy the history and how far how far we've come 
I think my favorite one was seeing the, uh, there was a head mold, Patrick Waugh's head mold for Patrick Waugh's mask back in the day when they were making those two. And as soon as, as soon as I saw it, you knew exactly, like, it's just a slab of like, you know, the shape of a head. But as soon as you saw it, you knew it was Waugh and Waugh's mask. That was, I think that was my favorite part of that. And obviously the history that goes back with him and Michelle, his dad, and how long they've been in the game is kind of neat too. For sure. Yeah. Just, just being there and seeing like, okay, like this is where, this is where it all goes out and this is where it gets built. And, you know, you never, I think that was the first time I've ever been at a gear factory and it's like, you know, the gear magically just shows up from somewhere to the rink. And, but now, now I know where it comes from and it's the, the great setup that they have and how much, how much effort they put into that. So it, um, yeah, it was, it was really cool to see. Okay, so from old school to new school, you're also uh, an ambassador for Sense Arena. We've been pumping those tires for a long time here at Ingle. You know, I think when it first came out, we were like everyone else. We're like, eh, can it really be that realistic? But, you know, quickly discovered it is. How have you liked that partnership for you? And also just like, how how do you use it? How do you put it to use? We see the videos. You, you do it in an entertaining fashion at times, especially when your wife isn't home. Um, I think I'd be dead if I hopped up on the kitchen table, by the way. Um, but, 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 but just from a tech standpoint, like just, you know, I think a lot of people, there are still some out there, despite the fact that guys are using it between periods in the NHL right now, still wonder how realistic can this be? Yeah, it, it blew my mind. I think it's it, at first when it came out, I always like wanted it, but I know that the price point was pretty high and, you know, I have to get the headset and I have to get the membership. So it's been a blessing to be able to work with them and, and, you know, uh, do some, do some fun content as well. I really enjoy it. And, you know, just going back to being, getting ready for the call that I didn't know when I was going to get it and get a deal and go play games and, uh, you know, getting the sense screen a couple weeks before, before that uh, was able to, you know, run through some penalty kills and screens and all this kind of stuff. So it was, it was pretty cool. I think I, I was in the basement for a few hours every day, just going through the drills and playing against the different NHL teams and doing the challenges. So yeah, it's, it's really realistic. I like, especially when you can strap, strap them on your gloves, you get the realistic, you know, where your hand placement is. It definitely helps with reading releases. I think that's been uh, it's been a big thing. Like when I when I do my sensory off the off the ice and the next practice, I feel a lot better. Rather than we just had a couple of days off here and came back came back to practice today, and I was you know there's a couple of things that I really wanted to work on, like tracking and hand glove movement, and I was able to just you know put the time in and where I want the shots and like how fast and where they're coming from. And I was able to work on those things and um, going out, going on the ice today after two days off, I felt, I felt great from the first, first drill tracking puck. So they definitely noticed the difference from there. And then, um, you know, took, it took me a little bit to be com- comfortable enough to use it as a pregame warm up, But now it's, it's part of my pregame routine when I get to the rink and uh, trying to find, trying to find a little spot where I can, I can put them on and do that. So I think it, it helps, helps with that. And the big thing has been the games I'm not playing to do it since I know I'm not getting a ton of shots during, during warmups. I still, I can run through a little longer workout in a way, 15, 20 minutes of, of drills and shots and, and then, you know, get a handful of shots only in warmups. And then if something happens, I need to go play. I feel comfortable that enough that I've, I've seen a lot of shots that day and you can just jump in, jump into a game right away. Oh, I love to hear that. I think it's important um, for guys like yourself and Joey Decord, who told us he was using it in between periods and certain times and use it as part of his warm up. I, I think it's great for the kids to hear that. It kind of normalizes it because I do think early on for some of the kids that were using it, you know, you know how hockey can be, right? Like something that looks different can, can lead you to, getting heat or getting razzed by your teammates. And so for, you know, for the kids that want to use it as a warm up, it's okay. Like at the highest levels, they're using it for a warm up. I think it's good for them to hear that. So they don't have to worry about what, yeah. whatever little Johnny wants to tease him about. Cause he's, he's an hour before the game, he's got a headset on and, and the paddles in his hands. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, 
it's a great tool. You can do it wherever. And I think you can even even sit on the couch if you want to just, you know, work on work on your eyes and seeing those releases. You get you get pro guys who shoot pretty pretty hard on, on there too. You can see that. So uh yeah, it's just keeping staying sharp and also get better that way. And uh with all the different all the different drills that they have, you can, you know, really get a workout out of it and get some get some screenshots and those those penalty kill scenarios that are those are hard to hard to especially during the off season. Like you might not have time to get that much that many guys out there. And even if uh that like my plan for this summer is like get it on the ice. Don't have to worry about shooters and try it on the ice and how it how it feels when you can skate and slide into the shots and drop down. So um I'll be excited to try try that out. I haven't been able to do that yet. So um yeah. So we'll see. It's been it's been great. It, you can do it like I said, anywhere before games. Um we'll see if I'll I'll ever do it between periods, but maybe if I don't get any shots, but, um, well, that was one of the reasons that was one of the reasons that, you know, like it's, I think once it was cause just the glove didn't feel right. So just took, did the cannon drill at a bunch of gloves. And the other one was, if I only see three shots in a period, just a couple of minutes and just like you're feeling seeing pucks. Yeah. That's, uh, I haven't gotten there yet. So maybe, maybe at some point I'll keep the headset so close, but, um, yeah, just, just pre game. Like even after practice, you, later that day just you know reading the shots is so so important that especially for younger kids i feel like it could give a give a huge advantage if you just start seeing some pro shots when you're growing up and you know that way you go on the ice the next time and everything just feels slower and easier so um yeah like even for a guy like me i'm like oh this didn't feel right today so i have to like go and i can i can work on it and you know trying to get better that way so what does this summer look like uh you've obviously shown that you can play you know at this level again goals figure out hopefully have another deal and stay over stay in north america and keep playing over here i guess hopefully sooner this time so you don't have to go through the stress of a summer like last year yeah for sure i mean i think right now um i feel like this year i've been able to you know get back into the mix and played well so i feel like that should that should help. And, you know, the focus is on playing, playing in North America again, playing in the AHL and, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully stay in Laval. That would be plan A, obviously this we enjoyed here and it's been a good setup. I feel comfortable and the team is great and facilities, how the organization is and takes care of its players. So I think that would be option A other than trying to, trying to look somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, if it's if that's not what the what the team wants, then yeah, somewhere somewhere in the AHL would be great. And I feel like with with my experience and with my age, maybe I can. I know the league is getting younger, and a lot of teams have their draft picks who come and play in the AHL. So it's kind of what I've, I've been doing this year with uh, Dope Besh here in Laval, and you know, just trying to help them as much as I can and. Obviously, I don't have all the answers, so he, he helps me out with some some things as well. <laughs> uh, keeps me young that way, but uh, yeah, it, it, no matter what role it is, like just want to come to North America and play play games, and uh, you know that's the that's the plan. Okay, so in the meantime, I think we we like you're a must follow for the goalie community on Instagram, uh, YouTube. You release stuff there. What anything else you've got going that we want to make sure we let people know so they can follow and check it out? Uh, any any things that can help, whether it's something to help a young goaltender or just follow along the light the life uh, of of a professional goaltender. Anything you want to plug before we let you go? Uh, no, I think I think that's it. it. Should should find me on all the social media platforms and have a lot of have a lot of sensory in the content. So if you're on the on the fence about it, you can go. <laughs> go and search some of that stuff and uh yeah I, I really enjoy that but yeah trying to trying to help as much as i can maybe obviously keep the keep the content fun and positive and educational and uh hopefully hopefully some kids get some out of it i feel like i'm getting a lot of a lot of messages and a lot of comments how it's fueled up their flame to play goalie again or 
young kids and it's inspirational. So uh, whether if it's just one kid sh- saying that, then it's, it's my job is well done. So I, I really enjoy doing all that, that, uh, that stuff and help out and connect with fans and show this crazy unique lifestyle that, that I get the, what it's like. And, um, you know, something to look back on one day as well, but, um, yeah, just trying to, trying to stay out of trouble and try not to get canceled. Well, uh, you do a great job, um, much like you did today. We appreciate your time today, too. There's lots of little insights and takeaways and tidbits here that I know we get a lot of parents that listen to the podcast with their goalie children on the way to tournaments and games on the weekend. And this one is chock full of great advice and tips that I know they'll take away from. And I know if you don't already, folks, make sure you go follow them on all the social media channels because there's plenty more where this came from. Uh, Cassie, you've always been, always been so great to us, so great to the goaltending community. Uh, good to see you back in the American League on this side and really appreciate you coming and joining us today. Thanks, of course. Big fan of the show. Uh, hopefully, I don't have to wait another five years to get back. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure one way or another. Maybe we just have to do something in person now that we're, like, we're trying to learn the content thing and all that. Maybe we just got to come see you in the summer in Minnesota. As a matter of fact, we might be doing a trip to Minnesota, so we'll be in touch. Yeah, perfect. Let me know. He's a social media influencer, does a lot uh, on that side of things. So at least he was able to uh, keep his uh, mind busy, his body busy uh, while he was looking for a contract. I, I think what a lot of people would be interested in and uh, were were fun uh, to, to listen to was bouncing back and forth between gear, gear styles, gear manufacturers. Interesting too. Like I think... I make the mistake sometimes of always assuming because you're in a certain brand that your pad is a certain style and updated. We forget that, you know, so you hear him talk about starting the season in his Bauer gear that he wore the entire season over in Sweden. Well, of course, as he said, it's like road hockey gear at that point. And he doesn't have or he didn't have the fixed knee, right? So he wanted a softer knee. So I look at the true gear and I'm like, this seems like a really extreme switch for you. And yet, because he wasn't in the fixed knee, the true gear compared to new Bauer gear with the fixed knee, obviously that's going to feel more like what he was in last year than something with that sort of fixed angle between the knee and the face of the pad. So it makes perfect sense when he explains it. But when from a distance without knowing the specs, you just assume it's like, man, those two couldn't be more opposite products. And yet compared to what he was in before, maybe not. And Hutch, you discovered that uh, Casimir is a, a record setter. He is a record setter. This is an all-time goaltending record that I you know, talk about burying the lead. That should have been the first line of your intro, don't you think, Darren? Should have, uh, but I'm a bad host. Yeah, yeah, you're just terrible. We're, Slap we're lucky. my fingers. Well, that's, that's, we get what we pay for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the all-time goaltending record set by Casimir is the longest time between appearances on the In Goal Radio podcast. I think we are at. Uh, what is it? 250. Oh, you're at 250. Two, 244 episodes. 244 episodes. So um, who can break that record? Bill Ranford, I maybe could break that record if we got him on soon. No, we no, had him on. We recently. had him on uh, between. Well, certainly. You're right. That's more right. You and I than... sitting in his kitchen. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How can I forget that? Well, we're going to have to actually, find somebody. I really don't know how you forgot that. We were literally at his house. Oh, I know. Well, age, buddy, age. Let me tell so you. So Casimir was on, he was in the first Episode 10. six, yeah. Six. I mean, production quality was low. We barely knew what we were doing. He was sitting in his bathroom, I think, with the uh, iPod headphones on to record it. And we had no systems on our end, but we cobbled together what was a really good interview then. I loved it because he was sitting in his home uh, in Markham, just outside Toronto. I mean, the guy moved to Toronto and moved in like he wanted to be there for the rest of his life and bettered himself in the community, um, not just sort of in the athlete condo downtown. And I think that tells you uh, a lot about the person and what an organization signing him gets in that person. What I remember about that is because Markham was, uh, that's where I lived when I was in yep. Toronto. It wasn't uh, right beside the practice facility or the the. It's a ring. long commute. Uh, but he moved there to have a bigger yard for his dogs. Yeah, like that. That's when I knew I loved the guy. Really loved <laughs> the guy. But that that was pretty neat. Uh, getting some insight into Casimir. Yeah, fantastic person. 
he, he's a fun follow too on, on social media. So let's get into uh, Cam Talbot. Let's slide over to the LA Kings goaltender. Uh, shorter conversation, but uh, still really interesting conversation in the midst of a, of a playoff drive when Woody got to uh, hook up with him in Vancouver. Yeah, just a couple of minutes. And you'll, as you'll hear, we talk a little bit about skate blades and replacement skate blades. Then we get right into motion. And you've seen this on the Ingle mag.com website. If you're a subscriber to Ingle Premium, you've seen the drills. You've seen us talk about it at both levels with the Ontario Reign and now with the Los Angeles Kings. We've got several drills up there where their goalies are using, you heard it from Linus Allmark last year, recoil. The concept, we always talk about set and square. Well, they set and square, and then they got a little backwards drift in their game. Uh, they call it motion. Mike Buckley's the goaltending coach that sort of brought it to the organization. And so we wanted to get into it with Cam because it's something he's actually done a long time and it, and that's made this transition for him that much easier. So when we talk about it and we run drills about it, we thought it'd be great to ask a goalie who's been in the National Hockey League for a long time about how and why it works at this stage in his career and with the league changing in terms of how they attack. First off, I want to ask you, um, this is a little bit of a minutia, but I couldn't help but notice like four minutes into the game the other night, changing blades, both blades. At first, I thought I'll maybe hit a post and got a rut in there, but both blades tells me it's probably ice. Is that unusual for you or do you have different sets and different hollows that you like to keep out there? Uh, no, I don't know what was going on. Like in, um, in warmups, they just didn't feel as sharp as they normally do. Um, I gave them, I have like a special sweet stick in my stall. I tried that after warmups to try to remedy the situation myself. Went back out for the first, didn't feel right still. And then when they got a power play early, I'm like, okay, hey, I can't wait. I was going to wait till the first TV timeout so I didn't slow down the game. But uh, since I got a power play, I'm like, okay, I got to do this now. And uh, the refs were nice enough to let me do that without giving me a penalty as well. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty unusual for you in terms of like, it's not something where you've got different hollows sitting there waiting. No, definitely not. No, that was just, uh, I think it was an anomaly. Normally, my skates are pretty dialed in, and you can tell right after I changed the next set, they're all supposed to be the same. I don't know, maybe I stepped on something I wasn't supposed to step on going out, but uh, yeah, all my hollows are the same. That's not uh, something I usually do. Okay, good to know. Um, I guess it is the benefit of the quick release skates. We always see when it fails mm -hmm. and a goalie can't get an edge, and everybody starts yelling, should you blow it, shouldn't you blow it? But there's the positive side. Absolutely, yeah. I know it uh, makes their life a hell of a lot easier. And the like, guys come off and they'll change still three or four times a game. It's crazy. As soon as you lose one edge, um, you know, if you're a goalie on the bench, you're always getting shooed out of the way because guys constantly have to come down to the equipment guy and change their skates. But it takes about 15 seconds to switch out both skates now. So it's, it makes their lives a lot easier and ours because we don't have to sit there and wait for another sharpen. Got that out of the way. Speaking of edges, you've played with a really good edge this year. What this season, the bounce back, statistically at least, what do you credit it to? Like, what do you, has anything changed for you? I know with Mike, we, we talk about motion and something that's always been in your game and maybe now something that is there more purposely. Like, it's a big question. There's a lot of different factors. What, what do you see as the biggest factors to, to all the success you've had this season? Yeah, I mean, I got to give Mike a lot of credit. Um, from the time that I came in in the summer to start working uh, with them, it just seemed like uh, it was kind of a seamless transition. Um, and they brought that to my attention. They said that that motion's always been in my game, but him and Billy, they preach that kind of thing. So guys they don't have in their game, it's a little bit more of an adjustment. But for me, I was doing it all along without even knowing that I was doing it kind of thing. And um, for me, it was always just setting myself up for, you know, the, the secondary opportunity or something like that. And uh, apparently doing it all along helped me transition to working with these guys. So it's kind of, like I said, pretty seamless, but uh, obviously I got to give the guys in front of me a ton of credit. This is a, a great team, very sound defensively. So uh, as long as I can go out there and just do my job and give us a chance to win, uh, you know, the guys in front of me take care of a lot of it as well. But, you know, after last season, a lot of people probably wrote me off and it's happened. Before. Not us. I <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, but it, it's happened before. And, uh, you know, given my, my journey to the NHL and stuff like that, there's always been a need to prove myself season in and season out. And that's just the way my career's gone. And, you know, having that little chip on your shoulder definitely adds to the, the motivation for sure. Was that conversation, like when somebody pointed out to you the motion, you're probably aware of it, or was there a bit of like, oh yeah, I've all, like a lot of guys don't, right? Like it was a big deal last year when Linus talked about it and wins a Vesna trophy, adding what they called recoil. I'll be honest, I thought most guys were set and square in the league. I kind of missed a few. You always had it in your game. Like, does it just, is it more comfortable when you've got a coach saying, hey, this is something we want all our goalies to do, and here's the benefit? What are the benefits for you? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, when they're trying to teach guys and integrate it into guys' games, when it's already in my game, it just means that I've been doing something right all along. I just didn't actually really know about it. Um, I just naturally did it. But uh, like I said, it, it gives you a better chance of the secondary opportunity. Sometimes when you're you know, set and square, you can make the save. It can go to the left or the right. You've got no momentum going either direction. So if you've got that little bit of glide back, you're still taking away the angle on the first save, but you're already almost moving towards the second shot without even having to push yet. So it just gives you a little bit more, a um, little bit more time, a little bit more speed to, to get to the next spot. It's subtle for you. Ritter looks like a guy who's working on it. It's a little more pronounced. Subtle for you. Um, is it important to not exaggerate it uh, and sort of not have it as something that maybe teams could even look for? Yeah, I think if you exaggerate it, then I think um, sometimes your feet can get a little bit wide. Your hands can drop a little bit. Everything kind of becomes a little bit more compact. If it's subtle, it's just a little bit of a glide. Everything's still square, and obviously you're not giving up the net. The more that you exaggerate it, the quicker you're going to come back in your net. You're going to open up holes on the first shot that you don't want to open up, obviously. And uh, you don't want to give these guys any more room than they need because they don't need a whole lot of space these days. Promise I keep this one quick. I'm going to enjoy the rest of the road trip. I really appreciate the time, Cam. I appreciate it. Thank you. You teased that last week about the flow, and I've been waiting for it uh, for for eight days. I just to get a little more insight into that because I'm trying to just figure out how much to use. And I get a little active uh, with that. So uh, really interesting stuff from, from the national hockey league. Just check out the article too, right? Right. There's some great video there on Ingle. Yep. And Cam talked about it, right? Like you can't do it too much. And if you watch the video, you'll see the difference between him and David Riddich, David trying, but for Cam, it's also, it's so natural. He's done it already. David, a little more active and trying to make sure he's got it in his game. And when they do the reps in the video, you can see it that much more clearly in David's game. We saw it in Eric Portillo's game. We had that conversation with him. You know, so more and more teams sort of, this is something Buckley did in Pittsburgh. It's something that I know in, in Nashville, they call it a teeter. It's very subtle with UC Saro. So, you know, I always thought set and square, and that was on me. There are teams that have been using this uh, a little more steadily than maybe we I believed when Lena Selmark talked about it last year. Well, it's, it's so subtle, right? It's hard to even see if you're if you're not you able to have a camera locked on a goaltender. Well, that's what I'm supposed to be doing when I watch. So my bad. Well, you're you're also from way up top, right? You don't. Have I'm also just goalies. drinking coffee in the press box and relaxing. <laughs> so, what uh, what's the press box snack of choice in Vancouver? Uh, all they give us is popcorn. Hmm. M and M's in uh, in Vegas and gummies. You like I'd weigh, I'd weigh twenty more. You guys pa- don't I'd weigh twenty more pounds. Yeah, we we have different kind of gummies yeah. here in Vancouver. There, <laughs> regular gummies. Uh, okay, yeah, you're right though about the the pounds. They over a homestand, I do tend to uh, to add on a little bit more. That, fun stuff today. Uh, I have to go. Uh, I apologize, but I have to fly. I'm checking out the uh, nine sixty sale over at the hockey shop uh, and thehockeyshop.com. dot com. Uh, because uh, that thing is like, I just can't imagine it's, it's on sale. I've got to go over there. Uh, Hutch, uh, thanks for your guidance on the parent segment. Well, I hope it helps somebody. I'm I'm going to use it, uh, with my kids. I'm, yeah. I'm but, but I want to play hockey, it. but I, I do, well, I'm going to institute that. So, uh, really cool. And, Baby uh, steps. and, uh, the nine game homestand, uh, you got through that in Vancouver, Woody. And now it seems like a more regular, uh, schedule the rest of the season for the Stanley Cup playoffs. 2015, first game since 2015. You're going to have a home playoff game, buddy. I got to cover Seattle last year, so I got my I whetted my appetite covering the Kraken's first playoff series, and now it feels like the first playoff series in Vancouver. That's how long it's been. I'm looking forward to it. Be safe and happy goaltending, everybody. Thanks for listening to In Goal Radio, the podcast. 